He's an AI rock star. He's a bit of an AI prodigy. He's, I mean, uh, he, he's got signed early. That's right. He got signed. Yeah. He got, that's right. He got signed early. He. I mean, he was. Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for leaders who are looking to drive improvement in their customer experience and culture together. Today, I'm joined by Rex Briggs, who's a well-known leader in the AI space. Uh, he's the chief AI officer at Claritas, and he's also a subject expert at MMA Global, where we're both involved. Thanks for joining today, Rex. Of course, for you, Matt, anytime. So you've been at the forefront of AI for many years, uh, from the invention of multi-touch attribution to recent innovations on personalization. What do you see as some of the biggest opportunities for marketers related to AI? Well, it really is a golden age. I was planning on being semi-retired and just doing industry work with you and MMA Global, and I got uh, so excited about the advances and what's possible for marketing that I wanted to dive back in and build. And that, that, that's why I took the chief AI role with Claritas. They have a great set of data available on customers. And of course, they acquired Arts AI, which you and I know through our work with MMA. Uh, Global was d delivering some amazing results. Uh, I think, I think that there's so many opportunities the issue is really how do you prioritize and get as many people moving in an organization simultaneously as possible one opportunity on the very large side is that we're going to see a complete evolution in how multi-touch attribution works it's been very rear view mirror uh, as was marketing mix model before that and what you and I have seen in our work together on the Consortium for AI Personalization is that these things are dynamically optimizing using AI with unsupervised learning. This real-time nature is really amazing because instead of it taking a week to analyze and looking backwards, it's happening in milliseconds dynamically in real time. It's reacting to the world around it if there's changes. And, and that really allows us to change how we approach multi-touch attribution because we can optimize the message and the audience. And soon I think we'll be able to orchestrate the, the experience and the touch points together. I mean, that's one of the things I'll be working on trying to figure out how to execute that math. Um, so I think it's really just a very exciting time because of that new real-time capability. I think this real-time thing is huge. Uh, you know, in the past, when we wanted to measure campaigns, often we would have four to six week lag times to get data. Um, you know, around store sales and things like that. And now there's a lot of low latency KPIs you can look at to drive sales, to drive, uh, to not, not just sales, but to look at other KPIs along the journey and optimize them with AI. Do you want to share a little bit more about the consortium for AI personalization you just mentioned and, you know, how that taps into some of this real-time opportunity for unsupervised learning? Yeah, and I want to come back to your point also about the low latency metrics and how do you get the balance right, and then also how, about the overall customer experience because those are those are challenges that, that that we need to get right, and we can easily get them wrong. Um, so the consortium for AI personalization is through uh, you know Yura and I work together on a day to day basis with MMA Global to help bring marketers together from different industries and categories to learn through measuring real world campaigns using this new AI personalization technology. And it's global, right? I mean, we're doing this in different countries, we're doing it in different industries. And we've seen uh, in general, very strong results, but we've also seen a few results where it hasn't worked so well. And that's teaching us a lot too. So what I love about these industry studies is it isn't a vendor trying to prove a point. It's marketers working together in the ecosystem to try to learn together how to improve marketing. That's why I'm involved. At least. For me too. I, I, I got involved in MMA to work with, uh, you know, marketers to help have impact, to raise the game for marketing together, collaborating, to work with interesting people and interesting companies um, at the forefront of innovation and actually have an opportunity to do experiments and learn and, and prove out what drives impact, which is, you can do it one company at a time, but MMA Global is a great community of marketers to do this at scale. That's right. And, you know, when you learn something like what we're seeing here is that you can more than double your conversion rates. I mean, that that's game changing in the competitive landscape. 
The issue though, in my view, is that it's not about having the learning alone, it's how do you scale? And so if you really, what's going to happen with this technology is in five years, everybody will be doing the same thing and it won't be the competitive advantage anymore. We'll have to figure out the next competitive advantage. But for those five years, whoever's on the early end of the curve and who is scaled first, they're stealing the customers of the people that were slow to move. So I, I get excited about that part, which is how do you help somebody build a capability and take market share because you're faster in the innovation. And I think that also sets you up to be faster in the next innovation, which, you know, right after AI personalization, which is about the ad serving part of it, is the generative AI that can plug in and feed it. And after the generative part, it's the whole feedback loop of doing this across the entire experience, including your call centers or in-person experiences. So I think that there's a lot for companies to do. And this is the skinny edge of the wedge that gets you sort of in building on the on the learning and the capability and expanding appropriately. I love this uh, theme you're hitting on around the culture of experimentation of companies really looking to increase the speed and the quality of the experiments they're running. Um, a great example I read about in a book about culture was um, about uh, booking.com and how they actually run like 10,000 experiments a year and how they had a new CEO come in, want to do something. And in the staff meeting, someone said, when the CEO said, go do this, they said, okay, I'll run an experiment. You know, so like even the CEO didn't get a pass. Um, but uh, you know, what we're seeing now with AI is that the cost of running tests and the cost of being able to test a hundred versions of content instead of just four or five of them, you know, with ABN split testing is going down and the ability to learn and drive things and drive you know, things where you can get the data much faster so you don't have to wait two weeks, four weeks, six weeks for the next iteration. It's the, it, there's much more opportunity to drive experimentation and the cost of doing the experiments is much lower than they used to be. The speed and the cost has gone down. Yeah, and you know, the, and that, that's both exciting, but there's always this little caution in the back of my mind about that low latency versus the long-term lifetime value. And I, uh, early in my career, when I did the very first ad effectiveness studies, it was like 1996 or something, I won some award from WPP, um, the Atticus Award, they called it. And uh, we had a nice dinner in a private club in London, as, uh, as Sir Martin would, would host, as you would imagine. And he, had, he sat me next to Jeremy Bullmore, who is the vice chairman of WPP. And he, Jeremy was just, I mean, I was like 25 or 24 or something like that, but he, he was such a senior statesman in the industry. And he said to me in the most polite, but put me in my place way, he said, you know, I read your, your study and I thought it was really interesting about the effect of, I think we had done something in Ford on the UK. And he mentioned that. It's like, yeah, I was influenced to buy a car once uh, from an advertisement. Uh, I'm like, oh yeah, you're on that brand. Tell, it, tell me about it. Oh, it's like, it showed the car uh, or the vehicle in a barn. And it was this, it was that. And I'm thinking, I had looked at all the creative. I didn't remember anything like that before. And that was exactly his point. His point, as he shared after he waited for my brain to tick and connect over, was that he saw that ad 17 years earlier. And since he was a younger man, he wanted that vehicle. So how do you measure the effectiveness? What he was asking me was, how do you make sure that you measure the effectiveness of these long-term arcs where you build this deep relationship with people when you're trying to measure a click-through or you're measuring a visit to a website or a, a dealer test drive or these you know, funnel metrics that we can measure? And that, that's really been the, the issue with, with MMA Global's uh, brand as performance, which is how do, you know, how do you get the long-term value? It was a subject of my last book 12, you know, 11, 12 years ago about this idea of measuring the longer-term impact and making sure you had leading indicators and you correlated those up. So I still think we have a lot of work to do to make sure that when we do measure some of these fast, low-latency metrics, that we dock those with longer term metrics like LTV and ensure that the two, uh, that you are predicting a longer term health metric of your business, as opposed to just a short term conversion of the wrong people. Yeah, for the, uh, the audience, the brand is performance uh, work that Rex is mentioning with MMA Global basically looks at uh, how long the uh, brand favorability and ability for brand to impact 
sales lasts? What's the half-life of some of that brand favorability? It's lasted at least nine months from some research that we've done, certainly can last longer so that when companies measure performance and get the short-term benefit and say, this is really high, that, that is true if you measure it through a short-term lens. But if you start looking over a longer period of time, the brand campaigns actually have much higher val impact on lifetime value than you're measuring them in a three month window. And, and you might actually make a different decision about your marketing mix allocation. Both brand as per and performance matter. It's about getting the balance right and, and, and getting the overall impact of your marketing, which kind of naturally leads to, you know, the impact of customer experience, because over time, you know, everything, all these different touch points, you know, lead to improvement in brand favorability or the opposite. Um, you know, you can, you can damage a brand very quickly, but you can also build a brand over time. Advertising is part of that. And, and what's interesting now with AI and content is effectively everything's inventory and digital. You've got advertising and you've got content you can deliver and you want to optimize that next best experience, whether it's a paid media experience or a customer experience using data. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, the the balance part is a mathematical equation. It's one that I'm specifically working on. Uh, in, in my last book, it was all about that that optimization part. And I think we've learned a lot more. We have new capabilities in the decade that's passed since then. But you know, in the past, it was about uh, how do you make sure that your selection of customers, new customers, um, are less likely to convert as easily as an existing customer for an incremental sale. And so our tendency was to over rotate on existing customers and uh, and neglect some of the brand development we need to do for new customers because a higher ROI mathematically was an existing customer. So I do, you know, I do want to try figuring out how do you get that that uh, that overall experience right? And then finally, how do you layer in what is your corporate strategy? Because you, where you may be today, you can optimize it based on the data you have today, but unless you're looking down the road and thinking about how the world is changing around you, you really don't have a true optimization. So like if you take the Hispanic population in the United States, uh, they do not account for uh, the highest, most profitable customers in most for most brands today, but it's a growing population. And so if you aren't factoring that into your longer term optimization, then you're not likely to actually truly have an optimal plan. So there's a lot of issues like that that we can think about. And so that's, I think why it's an exciting time is because not only do we have better machine learning algorithms to help us? We have a whole new generation of AI that can do unsupervised learning that can help us with AI assistance and as, as agents. Uh, so it's going to be a very exciting time in marketing. I, you know, you have a, a book coming out. You mentioned a couple of your previous books, but even another one coming out with MIT Press uh, in the new year called The AI Conundrum. Can you share a little bit more about that book? Yeah, I mean, th that book is really the product of my son, Caleb. Uh, being a dad and working in, in data and technology, I, I got my twin boys computers when they were 10 and uh, turned them on to this uh, visual uh, program, programming language called Scratch, which is just, you know, drag and drop, you know, put blocks together and you can make cool video games or, or class projects or videos. Uh, we actually, my son Caleb, after he learned it, was teaching teachers in the Reno Tahoe area how to bring Scratch into their classroom when he was uh, 14. And so that was one of our, our father-son projects was helping more people learn how to code. Well, he ended up around that time going from that effort to uh, teaching himself Java and then, uh, and then the original programming language for AI called Lisp, developed in the 1950s at MIT. And I brought him to a conference, um, an MIT conference, and, and he was having deeper conversations about Lisp and AI than I was. And so he was just you know, really excited about the technology. And he wrote a paper called The Fundamental Limitations of AI. And his view, view was that we need to be appreciative of the weaknesses of what AI can't do and why it can't do it and why, there, why those are challenges. So I'm sitting in the uh, in the in the classroom when he's presenting his his thesis, and uh, and so is a VP at Google, 
and uh, and a doctor and a couple of other people who wanted to hear what he had to say. And the guy from Google leans over to me and says, you know, we're seeing the exact same weaknesses at Google, but nobody's talking about it. And that was a moment when I decided, you know, we got to figure out how to get this published. And we sent it over to MIT and, and they were uh, they were like, yeah, this is really interesting. Uh, you know, and, you know, they were they not only signed the book to be published, they had Caleb sign a contract that any future things he produces, they get they get the right to have the first look at it. He's an AI rock star. He's a bit of an AI prodigy. He's, I mean, uh, he's got signed early. That's right. He got signed. Yeah. He got, that's right. He got signed early. He I mean, he was. He he did it. He ran out of math in high school, so his junior year he did math at Harvey Mudd, and his senior year at Stanford. So he's he's deep into the math part, and I've learned a lot in the process. My role was besides helping understand how to send something to a book, to ask to get published, and the rest of it was uh, focusing on the business applications. So I wrote most of part two. He and I, you know, collaborated on the very last chapter, and he wrote really part one. Uh, part two is about all these different business use cases like in marketing and in uh, uh, in trade or, or is issues of bias and where you need to be careful about it. So it's trying to think more of uh, how do you take what Caleb developed as a uh, as a theory and then apply it to business. And then together we're, we're jointly training people like the MMA members and the Inc. 5000 list and, and a few others. So it's been, a, it's been an exciting project to work on, but it's also kept me up at night because there are certain implications that I think are terrifying if we don't get ahead of training more people to understand its strengths and weaknesses and how to use it uh, in, in a proper way. So, you know, as companies engage their employees for upskilling and trying to empower them to apply some of these new approaches, which certainly AI allows more distributed citizen led approaches inside companies. What would be some of your advice for companies to avoid some of these pitfalls as they empower their employees to embrace this, to avoid some of these challenges? Yeah, there's a push-pull here. So the push is you've got to push your team to adopt AI. Uh, you should be making it very easy for them to, to spend 20 bucks a month or you know try pay, pay for this or pay for that and try different things. So you want to encourage uh, lots of trial. And the trial, the main point is to say the trial inside the operation is great. If there's a human in the loop, someone reviewing it, run, run as fast as you can. If you try five things and only one or two of them work, that's a win. Uh, there's a lot of room for efficiency and improvement there. So, so get the team running. That's the push part. The pull, pull part is pulling people back a little bit to say, you need to ask the question, what's the consequence if this AI is wrong? Now, a lot of the times the consequence is absolutely not much at all because it's internally, like let's say you decide to do an AI transcript for this, uh, for this podcast. Easy application. You can have a human in the loop that reads it and reviews it and tweaks the, the you know, few misspellings or, or misstatements. So you can construct a workflow where you're like, we can easily offset what, what could potentially be wrong. Um, great, run with it. But if you're trying to think about using an AI to make refunds and so forth, these things are so easily hacked, as we showed in the training session, that uh, you don't want to do that. Or Zillow using it to try to price homes. Um, you know, th those, are, those are much more risky use cases. The ones that really keep me up at night are that we're increasingly giving, creating agents that can do a lot on their own. So these autonomous agents, um, in my view, should not be anonymous. We should have them attached to a company or to a, to a per person who is accountable for what that agent does, because the agents right now are powerful enough to transact. I can create an agent right now that tries to create a business or a trading portfolio that can control cryptocurrency. It can make cryptocurrency and it can spend cryptocurrency, which means it can hire people to do nefarious things that it might think in its own internal logic is a great way to short a stock. No, we do not want to think that that is a safe application. So we need to really begin to have a much faster dialogue where people recognize, you know, what we need to do to to uh, to keep to keep these models safe. So not anonymous and better to be a co-pilot than a pilot. Yeah, you know, better to be a way to augment a human being or help help a human being than to than to completely go off and do things without supervision. I think so. 
you know, the problem is that, that we're moving so fast that I don't know that we can completely expect that we will get um, the identity right. So one of the things I'm trying to drive with the Claritas uh, taking that post was putting consumers in control of their own data, because I think with data, we will create more effective agents that work on our behalf. And I want to show a model of how those are bounded to a person with an identity, with permission and with control so that other people see that as best practice and that that's what we should be, uh, we should be standardizing. In fact, I'm going to try to open source those so that other companies who want to tap into these, uh, like the, the Matt, the Matt persona, an agent that you create that you can control, you could say, hey, I'm okay giving it to Disney because I've got kids and we're planning a trip and it can interact with my agent to help me plan the trip and come back with recommendations. So I, I think that that is the model for the future. And there's the other model, which is the chaos GPT example we talked about in the book where that one was a destructive power hungry AI bent on the destruction of humanity that began to try to figure out how it could acquire the most powerful nuclear bomb. That's not a good idea. I was telling Elon Musk when we were backstage at the possible conference that, you know, that the autonomous piece was not a good idea. And initially he was like against that. And then in, you know, a few weeks later, like Elon does, he changed his mind. And now all of a sudden he's pushing AI that I think is quite dangerous. So we'll see where things land because, you know, there's much more powerful people than me, Elon being number one on the list, that can take things in a totally different direction that, that, that might work out or it might not. It's hard to tell. In my own book, The CX and Culture Connection, one of the things I, I talk about is how um, culture is about behavior and, and it's, it's about mindset, skills, behaviors and relationship networks, all four of those. And behaviors is really important because culture is how things are done around here. A lot of what we're talking about with AI is getting people to do things in new ways and get comfortable. Uh, but what you're highlighting is when you make decisions and you encourage a set of behaviors, you want to make sure people don't overreach and do something that could be harmful without necessarily knowing that that's going to be the case. Um, there's a phrase I really like that the company Gore uses, which is don't, when you make decisions, uh, make sure it's above the waterline. Hmm. So you can empower, they, they have a culture of empowerment at Gore. It's a, you know, founded by a visionary founder and, and, and they're, they've been written up for a lot of um, some of the things they do to kind of work in small teams. And Mike Mangione from Gore was one of the guests on the podcast previously. Um, and, uh, this phrase above the waterline basically means, you know, if, if it's below the waterline, you sink the ship. But if it's above the waterline and you make a mistake, you can recover. So just the key, but what the, the key is to know where the waterline is and uh, it doesn't actually have to be a command and control. You can encourage people to think and collectively decide where's the waterline and then take action you know, and, uh, and and not always have everything have to be centrally controlled. Now, sometimes you want to have controls for some of the reasons you highlight, but there's a balance there between, you know, how much is cultural and encouraging behavior versus we need to really lock things down and control things. That's such a good point. I think that the issue is that in order to know where the waterline is in AI, you need to understand fundamentally things like uh, how it works. Like it's a universal approximator. It uses gradient descent. Gradient descent is a greedy algorithm. What does that mean? How does it make mistakes? When does it get it right? When does it not get it right? And really that that's the basis of the, of part one of the book, which, um, you know, MMA has bought a lot of copies. So, you know, if you're a member of MMA, get, you can get a free copy, uh, or you can do the training program, or you can, you know, read about some of this stuff on your own. But what we're trying to do is make it really accessible for people to raise their IQ uh, so that you know where the waterline is, you know what's safe, and what's not, or at least you have a much better you know, instinct around that. You know, one of the other things I'd love to kind of build on when you were talking about your experience at Claritas is, you know, um, this notion of um, first, second, third party data and in the data ecosystem, how do you take the data that's available and enable, you know, higher quality insights and greater speed of the insights to action loop in a company, you know, 
what, you know, when I first started getting to know Claritas, I thought of them as the place I would go to build really deep insights about personas because they have like 58 segments with all these really deep insights about the personas. And you can really construct really rich personas by Lego bricking together the different Claritas percent, you know, personas and, and, and really running your business that way. That's just one way to apply them. Love to hear your thoughts now that you're the, in the candy store about where you see things going. You know, what, what, what excites you about being part of a data company like Claritas and, and, and how can we apply that to kind of turn personas into actionable segments or other use cases you're thinking about? Yeah, I like your candy store example. I'm, I'm someone with a serious sweet tooth and they gave me the keys to the candy store. This is uh, this will be a lot of fun for me. The, uh, the, the, uh, I think that the first part is making the personas interactive. So the first thing that I did, and part of what got me excited about it was they gave me the data and for Prism, they have 68 different segments and they have connections, which has uh, like 50 something like you, you'd mentioned before. There's a few different flavors of their, their segmentation. So what I did was I took that data through and put it into an, about 3% of the data, not even all the data, just 3% of the data. I put it into a large language model and figured out the structure. And all of a sudden I was interacting with these personas that could name themselves, that could show me the pictures of where they lived in their houses and the type of things that they had. And, and it, it had a degree of realism that was close enough that I'm like, okay, I can, I, I, you know, this is something that's useful. But I could even then connect it up to see how should you talk to them? What type of um, of a sales pitch should you make for this type of a product versus that type of a product? So I think it, it, it goes from these storyboards that were very passive that we would look at and read and we would think about how should we develop a message to now we can interact and ask these personas, hey, I've got a new, new uh, car, I've got a new insurance policy, I've got this new this. Would that be interesting to you? Why would it be interesting to you? What would make you decide this would be important to you? You can also feed those personas into generative AI as part of the prompting system to help generative AI then create better messages. You can put it into media mix uh, data. I'm experimenting with that part to see if we can then measure the effectiveness and then have that help refine the uh, orchestration of the touch points and engagement. So that, that's one dimension of it. Um, the other dimension of it is flipping it around. And I, I just tried this recently and said, okay, well, what if I take my own segment and I try to see what it has right on me and what it has wrong? About two thirds of the guesses it made about me were right. You know, it knew the type, you know, some of the type of products I bought, the type of home I would live in, the type of neighborhood I would live in. Uh, but it had a few things wrong. Um, it thought I would like Brooks Brothers, and that's just not my brand. This is uh, Viore right now. I like really, especially after the pandemic, I like soft, you know, easy, comfortable. Or or if I'm going to wear uh, something like a suit, it's not Brooks Brothers. It's uh, uh, Etra, which I think has really cool Italian fashion design that I, that, that I enjoy, or Ted Baker, you know, some of these brands. So as I gave it that feedback, it, it began to adjust what it thought about me. And as it began to update the imagery, it showed a different vision that was much more in alignment. It, it, it was getting closer to becoming my digital twin. So imagine that we can, we can have a dialogue with these agents. They can learn about us. They're collecting more data. That's why I think we need to have control and, you know, as consumers over them. But now it can act as an agent and help me plan a trip. Or it suggested, what other clothing brands should I check out? And, uh, and well, the recommendation it gave me was a little bit pricey for for my uh, for where I would pay for a sweater, uh, but it was an interesting brand. I'm like, wow, 100% cashmere that looks really soft. I'm not willing to pay three thousand dollars for it, but that that looks interesting. So now I can tune it and say, well, that that price point's too high. What's something that's sort of more in the range of how I would think about you know this category? So I'm just super excited about what the data and what it makes possible. Yeah, for. You know, what's going through my head, listen to this, is that the um, the kind of ideate test scale cycle that companies go on of how do we generate ideas and how do we ideate what to do to improve the customer experience. There's so much more opportunity to leverage data to drive better decision making, to build better insights and to actually over time learn and, and recognize patterns and do prediction and describe things to figure out how to get those insights right and ideate the right things. 
you know, and then you can, and, and you, you don't have to be as rigid about things. They can evolve over time and you can test new things and you can work with many more micro segments than before to ideate. Um, and then you can test things and get rapid feedback. Yeah. So taking your idea, Matt, two different things that I, that if people are interested in beta testing this, I want to want them to contact us. Um, one is that we can now form a virtual focus group of these agents that have been fine tuned a bit with people's feedback. And first of all, we'll give a cut of that money to the people whose agents they belong to. But you can get overnight focus group information. You can get it in a conversation right now instead of having to wait for a couple of weeks to schedule a multi you know, city tour and to spend 10 grand to do these focus groups. And I think that you're going to get about 80 percent to 90 percent of the same information out of them. So I'd love to find a listener who already does focus groups and says, OK, I will try my regular focus group and I'll give the same discussion guide to these virtual focus groups and I'll see how close the results are, because I think they're going to be impressively good coming out of these agents. Then to your point about testing, I think that you can also do uh, the, the, these, they're called multi-agent models, but you basically put like a thousand different agents together in a virtual environment, like a sim, and it will run through a simulation of how they react and respond in the marketplace. I think that's going to become a more advanced way for us to really begin to think about, uh, I mean, you know, there was a trend of agent-based models about 15 years ago, and it was just too early. I think now is the time for those type of models to take off. For the audience, what agent-based modeling was about was if you can't get the perfect data in your in your model, you can actually combine and use agents, human beings to make heuristic judgments for some of the variables in the simulation. And you can actually get more of a system dynamic, broader model of what's happening that doesn't require as much data for every lever in the machine. Um, and over time, you can tighten up and improve the, uh, the modeling, but it allows for a more complex decision modeling involving some imperfect data, including human intuition and judgment to substitute for data for some of the variables, um, which, uh, which allowed for you know, really rapid progression and simulation and things like that. What we're seeing now is the ability to use data sets like Rex is mentioning to um, allow for more complex decision making and learning again against your learning objectives over time by the right learning agenda, the right you know, experimentation design and, and, and good use of AI to test things. That's one of the things I'm so excited about working with Rex at MMA Global is that we pick big problems to solve, like how do you um, leverage context and how do you leverage you know, creative and, and actually design an experiment that proves what works and then iterate to the next phase and the next phase. So it's, it's always picking the things that are worth solving for the industry and moving, moving it forward with the members. And we're lucky at the association to have Rex involved to help shape that well, with others like VAS, our head of research and, and other subject experts to really work with great members in, in constructing these ex experiments. Um, Rex, just um, one, uh, one last question before we wrap up here. Um, if people wanted to get involved uh, or, or um, uh, you know, reach out to you or others for some of the things you're involved in, whether at, uh, at Claritas or at MMA or otherwise, what's the, what's the best way for them to, to reach out or, and get plugged in? Well, with the- Other than going to MMA Global, of course, becoming a member. Yeah, as you'll say, uh, MMA Global, the best route is through Matt. So he is, he, uh, he is, uh, sort of my boss in a way, I think, is that, you know, you're, you're the one who, who drives the agenda of who we're working with or not, or if not boss, certainly the gatekeeper for, for what's a good idea. I think we're, we're good colleagues. We work close together. So I think if you're connected with Matt and you're thinking about a big initiative, you're talking to the right person and, you know, we'll, we'll get engaged uh, that way. Um, on the Claritas side, the, um, the, the beta program that I'd love to see people participate in is this consumer in control. And it's a moonshot. I mean, it might not work, uh, but I would love to find people who are uh, willing to take the journey with me and with, with us uh, to see if you, first of all, if you had, you know, there, there's a you know, browser plugin, there's a few other things that you do so that the, the data, we can see all the different data that you have 
and we can help you connect from data brokers what they know about you. We can put that all in one place. And we want to basically get feedback on the interface, what type of things you want to control. Like, for example, you might want the system to automate. By default, the way that I've designed it is that if it's a not safe for work, that data is never collected and it automatically sees that. It's almost like an ad blocker. The second that it sees it come in, it doesn't collect it because I think that we should be able to, to uh, assume in general that that's information that people don't want to share. But if for some reason you did want to share, you could turn that on and that would give you a more robust and maybe more accurate view of, of who we are. So when we look at our digital twin, it is uh, more you know, representative. So those are kind of decisions that I would love to have more people involved in and engaged in really thinking about, hey, how do we make this work for the industry? The design is for it to be open source so that other data uh, data partners in the ecosystem could participate in the same ecosystem. And uh, it just feels to me like we, we I feel like we messed up the internet. Uh, and I will raise my hand. I was the first person to implement third-party cookies. Myself, and thanks to Dave Thao, uh, innovated that at Wired so that we could consolidate our reports from our different domains. And then ad servers used it and took it in a totally different direction. And uh, now I look at it and I'm like, wow, if we had thought more about that then, we probably would have designed that system differently. This is our opportunity to design things differently. So if you want to get involved in you know, personas or virtual focus groups or, uh, or controlling your own data, uh, or seeing how this works in, in media mix and so forth. We'd love to engage with you either through MMA or through through Claritas or or through you know Sky Writing. However you want to connect with us or communicate with us, uh, you know let, let's let's try to do this as an industry together. Thanks, Rex. My, Rex, my brain is on fire. It's always a great conversation to chat with you. Uh, you definitely sparked some great ideas for me, and I'm sure you have for the audience as well. Thanks again for joining today.